Here you go. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Most of you guys know me, but for those that don't, um, so most of my, I, I'm based in Stockholm, um, and uh, uh, most of my work is uh, helping Peter and everybody else direct ACFO in some kind of useful direction. And then um, uh, my focus tends to be on the technical side of things. So um, I'm Thomas. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, where I occasionally share uh, stupidities. And then, um, so what I want to talk about today is you know, a little bit about open data content and open source software, and also look at one particular application of this, is like how we do this at Aquo, uh, um, because it's kind of useful to understand how these tools are used. <coughs> Um, so, we'll just start with some of the basics, um, so that we're all on the same page. So, what is open source software? And I'm actually going to let you read that, uh, rather than me trying to explain <coughs> it. The way it's been defined at Wikipedia. Okay. So open source software, you can, you can get access to the source code, you can change it, um, and use for essentially anything you want. Um, so why open source software? Um, and, and I'm going to talk so much about the generic case, I'm going to talk a little bit, you know, why open source software in our context. Um, so, uh, the kind of work that we do uh, government transparency, uh, information about uh, you know, international development projects. Uh, we think this kind of important work, uh, we also think that it's too important for proprietary solutions. We, we think that uh, it'd be a shame if some of these tools would be locked up in um, solutions that you have to go and pay large license fees to you know, vendors uh, like Google or Microsoft or IBM or whatever, uh, particularly since they don't, you know, they have an interest which is making money, that's the core interest, and our interest is something slightly different, our interest is to solve a particular problem over a long period of time. So we think it's too important to do this stuff in a non-open source <coughs> manner. Um, so open source uh, helps us avoid something called lock-in effects, and lock-in effects are um, essentially often you build a system on a particular, build a you know, solution on a particular system, and then uh, it's very very hard to migrate away from that, um, and and you, know, you tend to end up staying with that vendor forever, um, regardless of what the costs are in the end, because it's it's too painful to move away. Uh, infrastructure, yeah, I actually believe that the IT infrastructure that we're working on building with, uh, uh, many, we're working with governments, we're working with large uh, multilaterals, we're working with NGOs. This infrastructure is going to be really important in the future. It, it becomes some kind of governance infrastructure for these countries. How to run a country, how to monitor uh, the, the uh, infrastructure of a country, such as water pumps, you know, roads, schools, or other things. And um, uh, you don't want to uh, essentially have to pay a you know, typical, like a toll road fee every time you're trying to use this information in the, in the long run. It, it always costs money to run IT systems, uh, but you don't want to be beholden to uh, a corporate vendor at, at all points for the things that you do when you build these types of systems. I think the most successful um, the successful bureaucracies, I was going to say, I meant you know, regional governments, regional operations, actually owns its own infrastructure. You, you look at um, things like uh, electricity, roads, or whatever, the local community through a council or a government, local government, actually owns that infrastructure. And I think IT systems are going to end up in the same place. So I think that's really important. Um, uh, of course, open source software is free to reuse in other purposes and do other things with it that we hadn't thought about. 
Um, and um, the Spanish group did some research a number of years ago, and they estimated that open source software in general uh, saved something like $60 billion a year uh, to the consumer. <coughs> and having stuff that you can reuse uh, and that is open, you can study it, you can learn from it, you can modify it, and you save lots of money in the process, you know, I don't think, see why that would be a bad thing. And of course, a lot of the stuff that we build is uh, built on top of open source software, and we want to contribute back by doing more of that. So examples of open source software that you've probably heard of, uh, the Linux operating system uh, use, uh, is open source software, Apache web server, sort of, that runs large parts of the internet uh, is open source software. WordPress that you often see or use maybe is open source software. You know, uh, Firefox, the web browser, it's open source software. So there are many different ones. And they use a bunch of different licenses, so like the general public license, GPL, Apache, or Mozilla's public license. Uh, open content then. Um, so content uh, is different than software. So Wikipedia says the following, which you can have a look at. So it's very similar in some ways to software. It's content that you say you're allowed to reuse this some way or another. Remix, reuse, translate, do something with. Um, everything that you create, uh, software or content, like take a photograph or write a line of code, is protected by copyright automatically. That, that's like in the, you know, in our, the countries that we mostly operate, uh, all of this is built into law. So as soon as you produce something, it's produced by copyright, you own it. And you might have signed over that copyright to the company or the organization that you work for, for but uh, it's automatically protected. Uh, and, and open content makes use of the copyright and say, you're allowed to reuse this and I give you, you know, we use copyright law to give people right to use it. We say, you know, it's mine, but you're allowed to reuse it in many different ways. Uh, and and uh, something like a photograph is different than a piece of software uh, so that it's, it's, you could theoretically have written uh, a license that is the same for content that it is for software, but it doesn't work really well in the legal system, so there are different types of licenses. So it makes it a lot easier. And why? Um, you know, there are many things that we do that is too cumbersome to just have standard copyright on it. It becomes too difficult. So Wikipedia, for example, uh, has uh, uses the Creative Commons license um, where you have to share the same content. If you put it into Wikipedia, you automatically say you're people are allowed to use it and re share it with others. Uh, and, and, you know, if you had to deal with it in a copyright manner the way the copyright works normally, you would have had to ask everybody permission as soon as you wanted to change it or modify it or deal with it in a different way. So that, so essentially the copyright laws are too cumbersome to do something like Wikipedia. So we then have uh, open content defined by a particular license. So we reuse this information in things in ways that we've never thought about. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, you see lots of wi wi Wikipedia material used in many different ways ways that you probably hadn't thought about when you actually, the author sat down and wrote a particular section. Uh, we uh, specifically have something called the Aquapedia, which has water and sanitation uh, technologies and approaches and ways of doing things that uses the same license as Wikipedia, pro, you know, primarily so we can interchange data or information with the Wikipedia. We can take that stuff written by people and you just put it into the Wikipedia without asking any extra permissions. By actually having it in the Aquapedia, it automatically has all of those permissions. And we want to contribute back to the comments and say, so the reasons why we use open content is very similar to the reasons why we do open source software. Um, but it's worth pushing. Um, 
those reasons anyway. So examples, Wikipedia uh, uses the Creative Commons license by, as is an attribution, you say where the information comes from, and essays share alike, so you share that information. Uh, you know, whoever reuses that information also has to share the result again under the same license. And that's what uh, BYSA means, so Creative Commons, buy and share alike. Uh, Flickr, you can put your stuff up on Flickr and say, it's mine, copyrighted automatically, nobody's allowed to copy it. But Flickr automatically has, you can easily s select and say, I want to share some of this under a particular Creative Commons license. And so all of my photographs are, are set to automatically do uh, by attri uh, um, attribution, share alike, because I think that's a useful thing. And if you go to Flickr, you can search your whole uh, picture repository and say, just give me stuff that has a Creative Commons license on it so I can reuse it if I want to. I don't actually have to go and ask the photographer for permission to reuse that work. He's given me that, or she's given me that right automatically. And I do the same with my work. Uh, other example is SoundCloud, for example, uh, uh, a system which allows you to put online uh, audio files. Uh, and you can say they're mine, just like on Flickr, or you can say they're under a particular Creative common license. By just clicking, they have a nice little user interface you click through. So, open data then. Um, Wikipedia says that open data is the following. The interesting part here is that the way Wikipedia defines it, and I've seen it defined other places too, it says without restrictions from copyright, right? So, so open content is often considered primarily to be under a particular license. So, you know, a Creative Commons license. Is still considered open content, but Wikipedia says that open data is without restrictions of copyright. Uh, and yeah, that might be a way of thinking about it. it what's interesting with it is that um, the general, or at least the way I perceive the consensus around open data, is actually a better to have open data with a, um, a license attached to it that uses copyright to express what you're allowed to do with it, than to say there is no protection at all. Because in many legal jurisdictions around the world, that doesn't work. There, there, is, there, is, there, there is no such thing in many countries as information or data that you've produced that doesn't have some kind of legal right attached to it. And that means that if you say, open data is without any kind of restrictions whatsoever, um, then you end up with a situation where a lot of people are in countries that have automatic restrictions don't know how to deal with it. Uh, it becomes difficult. So, so an in interesting example of this is in Sweden. Uh, Sweden has a... Uh, if the government produces data, uh, uh, and, and the government then... It, essentially by default says, you're free to reuse this material. The license is essentially, you know, a, a seven word or whatever, you know, sentence. And it is covered by Swedish law. But it's actually incompatible with all the Creative Commons or other things. Because Creative Commons uses copyright law to do certain restrictions. And do allow you to reuse that data in a particular way according to certain laws. But the Swedish data that comes out of the government uh, is, is freer in many ways. So it's actually incompatible. It's the closest thing is uh, public domain, something called public domain, which is essentially you've said, here it is, do whatever you want with it. But it still refers to copyright law. Whereas the, the Swedish government data doesn't refer to copyright law, it refers to some kind of more fundamental law, they argue, that is, you're free to reuse it. <laughs> right? Uh, so it's actually incompatible with all the Creative Commons or the general way of 
of the rest of the world thinking about this stuff. So it's actually, we've, we've been arguing in Sweden for a while with the, with the lawmakers that they actually need to do a license this material. They need to say it's free, do whatever you want with it, and it's also available as public domain data under you know, Creative Commons Zero, as called, which is public domain. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so, one of the key things here is that um, we believe it's quite important to to actually put a license in this because it makes it clear for more people in many regions exactly how they're allowed to use the data, uh, even if in some places uh, that's considered a restriction, like in Sweden. So, so why open data? Uh, I'll start with the bottom ones here. You know, it's efficient to have open data so you can reuse it in different, you can save money that way, you don't have to collect the data multiple times. You can get new insights from the reuse. Somebody was going to use open data in a way you never thought of. You know, you can do data collaborations that are collaborations that you never imagined was going to happen uh, because people reuse it. I mean, it. An interesting example, in Sweden, um, the, the uh, the metro meteorological agency that provides weather reporting and stuff in Sweden essentially sells all its data. You can't get access to it if you don't pay for it, even if it's sort of part of the taxpayer thing partially. But the, that's the business model that that government department has. Um, and there were very few applications, apps, things on the web that you could see what the weather was going to be like because it was so expensive. And then the Norwegian government uh, released all its weather meteorological data openly and said, here, reuse it for free. And lots of applications showed up, even in Sweden, by Swedes, using Norwegian data, predicting the weather in my location. Um, I actually think it's better data too, I don't know why. <laughs> they seem to get that right whether it rains on me or not, more than the Swedes do. Um, so the, that was a collaboration that, you know, probably the Norwegians were predicting that, you know, there's going to be lots of apps in Sweden. Uh, but it had definite benefits. Uh, and the, uh, in our particular space where we work, uh, with Aqua, we have tools that we do data collection in the field. So Aquaflow, for example. Uh, people send out people with mobile phones to collect data about something, you know, public water points or schools or whatever. And... Um, what actually happens a lot in the, in the uh, De International Development Corporation is that to do a project, you need to measure whether that project is going to be successful. And to do that, you do some kind of baseline study. You say, what's the situation today? And then we're going to do our project, and then we're going to see what we ended up with, and then we're going to see whether we were effective or not. Uh, and and you know, er nearly every project has some kind of baseline study. Not everyone, but... A lot of them have. And no, nobody ever shares these baseline studies with anyone else. They end up just being some kind of proprietary thing that you just use to measure your own. And we spent lots of effort doing baseline studies and nobody sharing with each other. And it seems really silly. So one of the key things that we're pushing for as part of what we do is that we share all the data and it's open so that we don't have to do all these baseline studies again and again. Uh, and, and there are often like, people say, well, we'll share with others working in our same sector, but often the kind of data that you have might be useful to somebody you never predicted were going to need that data for something completely different. You know, the, and, and if it's not open, it's not even clear that it's available and people won't know that they can reuse it. So, um, good reasons for open data. Some examples, uh, the World Bank has lots of data. Um, they've shared it under uh, Creative Commons attribution license. Uh, OpenStreetMap uh, has data um, that is being collected by lots of volunteers about ge what the geography looks like and the things that are in our geography. And they have published that under the Open Database license. They did use the Creative Commons as well before, but they realized that that wasn't actually legally very good, so they come out with a, a better license, more suitable for databases, because they, some databases are, are treated differently legally in many countries. So US, for example, has a very different 
legal structure to treat databases than Europe has. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that that happened. Uh, uh, international aid transparency data, uh, the Dutch government publishes it, many other governments and big institutions have, st have started publishing data about uh, their spending, you know, where does money for the International Development Corporation go, where does it come from, who's paying for it, you know, who's getting what, whatever. Uh, what's it being used for? It's called the International Aid Transparency Initiative. Uh, it, it's unclear whether what most of that data is actually published under what kind of law, rule, copyright, whatever. That's kind of interesting, actually. Uh, so so uh, uh, it's one of those things where there's a, you know, lots of governments and other organizations said, let's publish this data. And they haven't actually sat down and said, how are you allowed to use it? In some instances they have, but in many instances they haven't, uh, which is kind of fun. But it's open data somehow, anyway. So how do we do it? Um, and I wanted to talk about a little bit about that so you can understand some of the practical implications of it, uh, of these things. We actually use many different licenses. Why? Well, actually, I think we've sort of covered that already, right? The uh, databases are treated differently legally than content is. Uh, software is treated differently legally than content is, for example. So you actually end up having to use a bunch of different licenses for different purposes. But we'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, people often mistake uh, things like trademarks. They mix it up with uh, open licensing in different ways, with, with uh, open source, open content, whatever. Uh, so we publish everything we do, or nearly everything we do, uh, in some kind of open fashion. That's our policy, that's what we do. But our trademark, ACVO, as a trademark, is registered and can only be used with our permission. That's not the same thing, right? So people can't take our data, do the data that comes out of our system, republish it and call it ACVO or something without our permission. So that's something different, right? So never mix up trademark with open data. We might give people permission to do that, but that's a different thing. So, Aqua Software, um, we publish uh, the software that we made, so Aqua Flow, RSR, Aqua Open Aid, together with Zimmerman and Zimmerman, uh, and other things, uh, primarily under a license called uh, yeah, a Faro GNU, GNU stands for GNU's, not Unix, uh, General Public License 3.0. Which is the, the license itself is managed by something called the Free Software Foundation, uh, generally called AGPL 3.0. So, so GPL is what well, Linux is published under 2.0, uh, and 3.0 was supposed to be an upgrade of the GPL license that Linux uses to um, essentially close a couple of loopholes around licensing and software and the way it's being used today. So when, when the licensing for, for Linux came about, when people created this license, GPL license, software was distributed on magnetic media. Tape, floppy disk, eventually on CD-ROM, so not magnetic, but optical media. But still media, something you have to send around. And the license said, if you distribute software, which was really the only way you could use software, was to get it on a floppy disk and install it on your computer. Then you also, if you, if you distribute GPL license software, you also have to just, you know, make the source code available. But then the web happened. So you could use software that was installed on somebody else's computer and just use it over the internet. So that was not deemed distribution, which meant that you could, you could have this open source software, let people use it, and not distribute any of the software and not distribute any of the improvements that you made or changes that you made, which was essentially against the spirit of the whole thing, but it was legally correct. Because when they wrote these licenses, they hadn't thought that that was going to happen. They hadn't thought of that option, right? So uh, GPL 3.0 was going to fix that and say, it's, it's called the uh, application service provider loophole in the GPL license, a, the ASP loophole. So they said, we're going to close that loophole and say, we don't think 
that's the right thing. We, if you use, you know, DPL software, you should also, uh, you know, as a as a web service, you should also share uh, the source code. And and you know, that probably was never going to fly because look at all the, you know, large internet service companies that we have. You know, everything from Facebook to Google and many many others. Right? They they have, you know, invested you know, millions, if not billions, in infrastructure around all their software. It's all, a lot of this is based on open source software. So Linux runs, the versions of Linux runs, you know, Google's, you know, million server clusters and whatever. And they never intended to share any of that publicly because they didn't need to according to the law, the way the license was written. So that sort of got thrown out. And they did a, a smaller upgrade to the GPL license called GPL3. Uh, and they moved this one paragraph that says, if you run a web service, you have to share uh, as well to a spe special license called ADPL. Uh, so most people that are not in the software business, they, uh, uh, they think that this whole thing of sharing if you use the software and you make it better, you should share. They think that's the default. But it isn't actually in this industry, particularly not in the web industry now. So, so they're a bit surprised when they realize that open source software isn't sharing the way they thought it was. Uh, but we actually, in Aqua, we actually believe that we get money that's meant to combat poverty in different ways, that's meant to do international cooperation. It, it's money that comes from uh, a pool of money is meant to do you know, help people in a common good. Uh, and we think it's morally correct uh, to say that you're allowed to use this software for whatever you want. But if you make, if you use it and use it as a web service and improve on it, you should share back the, any improvements. Uh, this is fairly controversial in the software industry. Not a lot of people use this license because <coughs> they don't like the restrictions. Uh, we think it's morally correct to do that, so that's why we picked that. And none of the people that fund us think that that's wrong. They agree with us. Uh, but um, uh, but it, it's just a choice that we made. We also think that it's sort of a competitive advantage for us. We're a, an organization that work in an area where we're working with, where, where we're semi-competing in a very niche way with very large organizations like the stuff we some of the things we make compete with organizations like Google. And they don't use this license on principle. They don't use software that uses this license on principle. Uh, so if, if they want to work with us and use our software, um, they're going to have to contribute back. Uh, so that's where we are anyway. Content. Um, we use a bunch of different licenses for content. Acropedia obviously has the same license as Wikipedia, so that we can share content back and forth. Uh, RSR and Flow, uh, uh, if content is created in our systems, such as descriptions of projects, such as updates, a little bit of photographs, uh, they have one more thing attached to that, it's called NC, which is uh, non-commercial. So we think that um, uh, that's important because many of our partners would feel very uncomfortable if they put content in, say, photographs of children in a village, uh, because that's where some educational project is ongoing. And then that material was used commercially without their permission. They wouldn't be happy about that. So we've attached a non-commercial part of that uh, for that content. Uh, for some of the vid video that we use, we do uh, uh, the normal uh, share alike, and then sometimes we just use the attribution so that you can use this for whatever you want. And that's the typical situation would be if a news agency wants to reuse some of our video for something without uh, having to share back that, then we give that option by giving this type, particular type of license to CCBY. Uh, if we think some of the material, like this material here, would be like a great hit on CNN, you know, we'll use it that way. It's not very often very likely, but anyway. Uh, data, 
Uh, it's interesting, the World Bank is using this license, creating commons, uh, attribution, share alike. Oh, actually, sorry, I say that wrong. Um, World Bank uses creative commons attribution only. Uh, but the World, you know, World Bank has a different agenda that many of the rest of us do. Uh, they don't think share, they think share alike is a limit on business. Uh, we don't care as much about that. Uh, and um, the open source community in general around data has said that the Creative Commons license is not really very suitable for databases. Um, so they created this new one, ODBL, Open Database License. Uh, so what we've done is we said we're going to, data that's in our database is actually going to be available under dual license. It's going to be available both uh, in a Creative Commons type license and the Open Database license. Which essentially means that you could easily take uh, World Bank data, mash it up with data from our systems, share, do a share alike on that, and, and you'll be okay. Uh, it might not be a suitable license from a legal point of view, but at least you won't have you know, broken our license agreements. Uh, and you can also use the more suitable ones, ODBL. Um, there, there are many pieces of software that has licensed in a dual way. So, for example, Mozilla Firefox is under the Mozilla license as well as the G, you know, GPL and general public license. Uh, so that it's, it's common that people do that to, to give more options. So we've done that. Um, another thing that comes up when you talk about open data particularly is that people misunderstand open data as being there's no privacy. They think that if you put information into the system, uh, that if all the information in that system, if it's an open data system, is going to be open. But that's of course not the case. Uh, so, for example, we have, you know, in an open data system, we have user account information. You know, your username and your password and your email address, <laughs> that's not automatically open data that's everyone going to share because that would breach the security of the system. You know, anyone could log in and do things in your name. That, you know, that makes no sense. Um, there are also things in our systems, um, say for example, uh, really simple reporting, you can use that to set up a site for a partner that has their branding and has their look and things like that. And there are, so there are system settings for your particular website that you use the RSR tool to build. Uh, that's not open as well. <coughs> Only you with your user account can use that. But the data that you put in about projects in, into RSR, that's going to be open. So, so people misunderstand. They, they think open data means everything is open. Anyone can edit anything. And that's clearly not the case. right? The same thing, use uh, Wikipedia as an example. Uh, you know, the content in Wikipedia is open, but you're not, you know, you, you're not allowed, you're not supposed to go in and destroy it just to be, because it's open. You can go and vandalize it, but versions of every con every piece of uh, uh, revision or every edit that's been made is kept, so you can go back and push it, you know, get rid of vandal vandalism and, and, you know, keep the content the way it's supposed to be. So that's important to understand. Um, and when we work with it, if there is private data that we collect, such as things like household level surveys, so information about things that might you know, uh, be some kind of threat or breach privacy laws around data for a particular household or a particular individual that's being collected in Aquaflow, for example, uh, we won't obviously publish that data in a way that people can be identified. So we will, at some point, publish that data anonymized or in an aggregate format. Uh, but, you know, if you collect data with our tools, the, the, the whole purpose was to help you do a good job with that data, but also publish it in some kind of way openly, so that we don't have to redo baselines, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, but obviously, we're going to protect private data. Uh, because one of the key objectives is to publish data openly and widely. 
uh, data security. Uh, uh, there are issues around this, of course, as well. So, so uh, you know, I mentioned not all data, like user login data, is open. That's obvious because. You know, otherwise, somebody will come and use that to vandalize your system and want, or use them for in an inappropriate ways. Uh, we take data security seriously uh, in our building our systems. Uh, you know, I'm sure we have holes. Uh, at the moment, there are areas where we're working on improving it. Uh, but one of the important things with this that comes up when you talk about open data is that. Uh, people say, so is the data secure then, you know, you know, the private data, for example, can we be sure that it's secure? And of course, we take it seriously and we do everything we can and we use good frameworks, we build things in a way that should be, a, you know, ensuring that it is secure. Um, but, I don't know if you've noticed in the last couple of months, there's been a lot of talk about data breaches in places where they have a lot more security, data security officials and people working hard with that than what we have. So, you know, the U.S. Army and uh, FBI and God knows have lost data. Uh, there's, you know, hackers, there, there's, there's a, a low-level cyber war going on between the U.S. and China at the moment, between the U.S. and Israel and Iran at the moment, where they're sending all sorts of you know, bad software to each other, trying to break in and steal data from each other. Uh, not necessarily directly from the, you know, the army systems or the navy systems or the defense systems, but from subcontractors, from weapons builders, from all sorts of places, right? And they have a lot more resource than we will ever have to protect themselves. And they get broken into anyway. Uh, so, so, we should, in this context, be aware that a dedicated, skilled attempt at attacking you and stealing your data is likely to happen, or to likely to be successful if they really know what they're doing. Uh, because if the big organizations can't protect themselves, if Google can't protect themselves, you know, with, ten, with a thousand times more engineers than we have, how the hell are we going to do it? So, so one of the things that we've said is that we take this seriously, uh, but data breaches will happen at some point. You know, data will leak out that we didn't intend. And uh, which means that we don't work as a principle what we call unsafe data. So if the partners that we work with say, this data is really, really important and it doesn't leak out because if it does, disaster will happen. Uh, then we say maybe you shouldn't be using our systems for that. We'll, you can find somebody else to do that with. Uh, you know, if genocide is going to happen because data leaks from our systems, that's not data I want to handle. This really has nothing to do with open data, but it always comes up in those discussions. That's why I bring it up now. So, questions, thoughts? You can throw apples now. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> if, um, I think I know the answer to this, but if the Creative Commons isn't necessarily that good for open data, mm -hmm. uh, do we plan to continue releasing under the, under Creative Commons uh, our data? I mean, is that to satisfy the World Bank? Or no, it's not. The, the answer is yes. We really. the way the way I planned it at the moment mm -hmm. is that we should continue doing it. Yeah, it's it, not to satisfy the World Bank, but it's to allow people that want to take World Bank data and take our data That's and do a mashup and feel that they're on reasonable legal grounds. Yeah. It's not that it's wrong legally to publish it under that license, but most lawyers, particularly in the US, says that it's not a suitable license from a, if, you, if you're trying to dispute certain things or trying to get the people who are misusing your data or whatever. I'm not so worried about that. No, no. It's, it's more that we're trying to make it, uh, what should we say, easy for people that want to reuse our data, that they don't have to worry that they're, still, they're not allowed to mix licenses and that it becomes wrong somehow. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. That's the answer I would expect. Yeah. Yeah. 
a question. Um, so opening your data and your software, maybe not the whole world is going to use our software or our yeah. data. But could it also help us as three organizations to, uh, to open up to work together? To at least we can connect our software and our data. Mm -hmm. And we'd also like, for discussing this license, help us for the text exchange among Central to, to agree on how we share those things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I actually think, uh, first of all, for example, RSR has an API uh, with no restrictions on it, physical risk, I mean, or programmatic restriction on it at the moment. It's like you can go and fish out whatever you want. We've essentially set a policy, don't abuse our service. If you do, we might stop you. Uh, at some point, we might put you know, some kind of restrictions that you have to register who you are for certain types of data. I don't know. Uh, but, but in general, you should be able to just get at that data if you need to reuse it some way. Uh, we're, we're also doing APIs to pour data in and whatever. But to put data in, you have to have some kind of relationship with us that allows you to do that. Uh, but um, I think it's very sensible for us to sit down together and think about what data do we have, how do we want it reused, and what, what are the considerations we need to think about when it comes to licensing, not just between ourselves, but also outwards. And it tends to be that the same tools, licensing tools, are useful both for both things, but not always. Does that answer the question? <coughs> or so, was it too woolly? Yeah, so it could be a way forward to also look at the license, which license everybody has, and if that fits on each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we could, um, we should probably think about the, you know, 360, for example. Yeah. Exactly how that is being used and how the data and software is being built and whatever that fits that, how that, you know, does it fit? Do we need to modify? Do we need to think about that? Yeah. How um, generally uh, abuse is um, dealt with in this realm? So if, if people abuse um, the licenses, yeah. essentially, they, they take, you say, if they take software or they take data that they weren't supposed to, and then what do you, how, what, how do you deal with it? Yeah. And, or use it in a way that they weren't supposed to. So, so uh, the general experience, uh, if you look at software in particular, is that uh, it works reasonably well. Uh, so, so people, you know, often companies take open source software, uh, do, you know, do something, distribute the software. You see it particularly with router manufacturers because they have to distribute something, right? They can't run a, a service without distributing router software. <laughs> um, so, so they'll take software, incorporate it into the router, and then send it out. And then people find that they used some open source software, but they didn't publish what they improved on that. And, and they did to distribute it. And what that often happens is naming and shaming works really well. You kind of go, hey guys, look, you've done this, you shouldn't have. Often people talk to them directly first. If that doesn't have the right effect, they just talk to the community. Because the whole software community is kind of, mm, what should we say, very... Uh, intense. Intense around <laughs> these issues. I, I was going to say aggressive. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so programmers kind of go, we're not going to use your tools if you don't fix this. So we don't have to buy any hardware from you. Blah, blah. So it tends to work itself out quite well. Um, I. I don't know personally so much about uh, misuse of open data much. You see, you see unintended use, I think, of Wikipedia content quite a lot. So people will scrape Wikipedia, will create a new website that has Wikipedia content on it and lots of advertising, and then there will be a link to the Wikipedia article. Right? So that, you know, that, that's within their legal rights. They're allowed to do that because the license says attribution, uh, this came from Wikipedia, and share alike. Well, you can reuse this information again. So, so they are within, within their legal rights, but it's kind of a stupid way of doing it. Uh, but essentially the way it gets combated is that the search engines just 
remove those things from their indexes so people don't actually find those sites very often. What happens with regards to the non-commercial? You know, like if somebody, if an ad agency uses an update photo or something from one of the partners, like yeah. how, how is that dealt with? Or is that if we find one of those, we can easily use the law to say you need to stop because you don't have the right to do this. But we would actually do that, not so. Well, you know, we would, you know, what, what legally um, we would probably have to go to the partner and have the partner pursue that. But we could, we would probably advise them on how to do it. Uh, but, but that's. You know the, the 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 copyright law and the licensing around that we have for this essentially puts the legal framework in place to control when that happens to to be able to go and say you know don't do that. But at a very practical level, <clears throat> say a, a, a news agency says, can we use this photo? And yeah. it's a, under a non-commercial CCBYSA license. Can we give them permission to use that, or no. do we, does some we have to get? We can't give them the permission to do that because it's not our copyright. It's not our photograph. If it was one of our photographs, if it was you took the photograph, then you could do it. But if it's, you know, Cordaid's partner in Bangladesh that took the photograph, they're the only ones that can give that permission. Right? How yeah. often does it actually happen that people download your software from GitHub? Oh, they don't. It, you know, there are occasions and people do it and whatever. But the, the content, the context we're in, uh, we haven't pushed this software for any other purposes. We haven't tried to get people to use it for any other purposes. Um, partially because it's not uh, really easy to install at this point. But, but, um, but we've got Carl. Where is Carl? There is Carl. <laughs> Carl is fixing that right now with, with uh, RSR. Right, um, and uh, we're going to do the same with Flow once once we get past having done it for the RSR. Right? So it is going to be you know, something that you should be able to just set up and get from GitHub repository and say install, and then follow some instructions to get the whole infrastructure set up. That's you know we need to get there, uh, but we're not you know we're not really there at this point. But we're we, we're working on it. Do you get a lot of requests to actually get that install instance from for RSR or something like that? No, we don't. We don't get a lot of requests. No, we need a something for that. Strange. I mean, we open source stuff, but actually nothing really happens with it. It's yeah. get up and gathering dust. Yeah. We just do it. I don't know. Maybe for the sake of doing stuff open source. Yeah. The, the, I mean, there is. That's what I was saying. Yeah, the reason is more for us to work. Exactly. Because it's already. I think in some partners, it's it's not about it's having the option to. I think some of the partners we're talking to, they want to have the option that they can split off and take the software and the data and and uh, you know mm. if, if they want to, they don't necessarily want to copy it, but they want to have the freedom to make the decision. We think of it like this, right? We run these services. They're kind of complicated to run. I mean. Look around yourselves, there is like aqua tech people all over the place, right? Half the people in the room are aqua tech people at the moment. We need this, these people to run our services. And uh, very, very few organizations have the stamina to do that for, these for, these, for this software, right? Of course, we develop it as well, but yes. nevertheless, right? And, and so these organizations, they don't, they don't actually, they're not interested in running this stuff. They want to use it. But the, the general principle is that the door is always open. You can come in, work with us, or you can leave. But if you leave, you can take the software and you can take the data with you, and we're going to help you if you need to leave, right? Uh, so that you're not locked into us. So the idea is that people, my idea is that people should never need to leave, organizations should never need to leave because they should be comfortable with us. We should provide the, the cheapest, most effective, best, securest, whatever, that you need to do this work. But if it turns out not to be true, you should then not be locked in. But um, Thomas, would I say, um, hi, what, what you're saying, this idea that open source is all about people downloading your code and run, installing it themselves, like Ushahidi or something, is, is just one piece of the open source movement, isn't it? It's, yeah. And it's a, for us, it's a relatively, it's a fairly small piece of it. I think that's, mm -hmm. is that what you're trying to yeah. say? Yeah. Yeah, 
Well, you're also, I think, some of the practical things we run into is uh, we had a partnership with Mars, and they wanted to bring projects online where their uh, employees could fund uh, cacao farming projects in Ivory Coast, and that we could do that publicly. The information is public, but it wasn't activated publicly, right? So they do have Mars internal fundraising campaigns and stuff. And there we also had the licenses, and, and uh, quite practically we had our open, open uh, unless <laughs> agreement, and they have their uh, closed and nothing can change agreement. So in these type of situations we have quite some fundamental uh, discussions, and it's not always easy, but it's, it's interesting to talk to partners quite upfront and be very clear on what's public and not. And I think that's one of the, the areas where we're really moving. Some of the tricky bits we're noticing now, for example, with uh, Cordate has some projects online. They did a whole new batch. They want to take some projects down. And that's also a complicated one for me, at least, is who owns the information of the project. Because it's not actually one partner. You have sometimes a funder, a partner, a local partner. They're, they're jointly working on a project. So the information on the project is then from one organization or shared or who decides. So there's many tricky things, I think, to... Uh, uh, and once it's open, it's also easier. If everybody agrees, then, then it's fine. But else you even get the different partners um, around that. Sorry. Mars. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because that, that, I think, is difficult in our sector. Because the a project is never executed by one partner. Right? So the information about that is quite, uh, it's for me, still a bit unclear who owns the information of one particular project and where multiple partners are uh, cooperating. Right, like a Connect for Change sure. project or program, we provide services to that, so it's a joint thing. They're interesting, we're, we're working with a particular government, uh, let's, let's call them the counterweight continent government. Uh, they're, they're, um, that's an in-joke if you're into Terry Pratchett. But, uh, <laughs> but, but if, if uh, uh, you know, they have extremely tight rules on how you're allowed to publish information and whatever, you know, not, you're not even allowed to tweet with them saying stamp of approval, right? Uh, according to the contracts. But in the long run, at the same time, that, that government is kind of going yachty, being more transparent or whatever. And, you know, the whole process of changing the way people work and getting into the habit of actually being more open. It's actually a long process. It takes a long time. You know, so you, you engage and work with these partners and then work with them to help them understand what it means to change, what it means to be more open and how they need to approach these things. Which is why all of this stuff I've talked about, <coughs> I've just written a first, second, whatever draft of uh, essentially a long blog post of, you know, in the IT tech industry called the white paper, laying out what is this all about, how do we do it, what's our approach, what's our recommendation, or whatever. Uh, I'm going to tweak it a little bit more because i have had some good feedback on it. But generally, we're going to use that as a way of explaining for the partners that we work with how all this stuff works, because not everybody can come to a presentation and ask questions about it. Uh, and, and we need to do more of that around our policies and why we do open data and why we have projects online and how we deal with other things like that. So, any other questions? Thoughts? How does this with the SMS data in your campaigns? I mean, do you use the UNICEF and NGO? Uh, no, so sometimes we just publish it openly um, without even asking because the whole process and actually getting the negotiations on, on opening data taking too much time, they don't have a clue, and, uh, but the majority uh, we can only publish parts of it because it's personal information, there's a lot of uh, privacy involved there. Yeah. So a lot of um, patient information for instance. Yeah. Yeah, so information that we think might be publicly important now, but could be more uh, private in the future. I mean, uh, when we started in Uganda, I mean, a lot of information on, on, on gay rights, I mean, we could have published that back in 2008 or 2009. At this moment, that would be a problem. Uh, if, that's, uh, if that information would be publicly available now. Um, so sometimes that's, that's also predicting a future date. But uh, I think the majority of our SMS data is, uh, is closed, fully closed. 
because all the talks with all the partners that more or less own that data on actually opening it up. I don't know where to get the time from to, uh, to set up the, these negotiations. It takes hundreds of hours to talk mm. them through it. Mm. I mean, if we work with a big organization such as Family Health International or so out of the US, I mean, they have about 50 lawyers to go through. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. They have. So that's, um, for me, that's a hassle. Mm -hmm. I, don't, don't, I don't even bother going into that. I say that we want to open up that data, and that they're, if, if they're willing to or they see the benefit that uh, we will do it. But otherwise, I'm not going to be an advocate for opening up that data because I have other stuff to do. Mm -hmm. Just basically that. Nobody's paying a bill on, uh, on being an advocate for open data in the sector. And that's still a big problem. Mm -hmm. And there are not that many examples, I think, on actually opening up a lot of data in this field that have actually proven itself that it did save the world or it has had an impact on humanity. I mean, it's just a buzzword. Open up data and save the freaking world. I mean, well, it's, I, it's not true. I would contest that. For example, medical information, yeah. right? How many kids under the age of five die of diarrhea? This is open data. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it's, that saves lives. Yeah. yeah. So on a government level, a lot of that type of information is open yeah. and is very necessarily so. Right? So there, there's a, I think, Especially when you talk about medical data, that is, uh, there's a, a very large case for making it open. Yeah, that, that depends on the type of information. If that type of high-level government data on actually on the country level is going to be opened up, that way, that's perfect. That's what everybody knows. That's also with your your baselines or whatever. That's 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 the perfect information. But on some other stuff, it's actually, what is the added value? What is the benefit? It's sometimes difficult to uh, to predict that. And I mean, generally, generally just saying, yeah, let's open up everything. I mean, that's the future. That's what we all wanted to do now. But but actually, one, one nice example, maybe in this respect, is that you have the Joyce Monitoring Program, right? GNP. And they have statistics in, uh, so that's UNICEF working with the World Bank and a lot of big guys trying to answer the question, how are we doing in terms of water? Yeah. Right? Now, the problem with that system is, is that they compile government data. So basically they ask countries, how are you doing in terms of water? And then they get an answer, right? And based on that answer, a year ago, they said, we're doing great in terms of the Millennium Water uh, Goals, right? We we're actually on track. We're even better than on track. It's going well. And then they compiled, not the JMP, but other groups, university groups actually. They said, let's look at the real data. Right? So they went to countries and did some studies. And they found out that a billion people actually have less water than the JMP says, right? So the JMP data was shown to be absolutely worthless, right? And how was that found out? By a couple of yeah, university people having to go there and do it themselves and opening up that data. Right? So that's another case where you know, open data, in this case because it, it came from academia, will have a, a huge health impact because all of a sudden everybody's saying, hey JMP, what the hell are you doing, right? We trust you to get these numbers right and you're a billion off. That's not exactly useful. In this case, I mean, that, that data was that good, that it was statistically relevant, that they had a good sample size, that they could say, well, in general, this and that happens because of the data. But a lot of the data that is generally being uh, gathered by all kinds of NGOs or other organizations in the field we work in, it's, it's not that good yet. I mean, they will say something what 40 people stated in that region of Kenya, but you cannot say for Kenya this is the, the, the way forward or this is what they say. Well, again, I don't agree. I mean, sometimes if you do paper-based surveying, often the sample sizes are quite small. Yeah. But there's also a lot of NGOs. So even there, you know, you might have a lot of NGOs having little bits of data, but if you add it all up, it could already be more statistically relevant than government's own data. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's the first point. That's the happy future. No, 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 that's already the case. But secondly, if you look at systems like Flow and you know, others are systems that capture information, for example, Hafia's uh, food security data, right? That's now, they found that, yeah, they used to do a couple of hundred, but now with new tools, they can do a couple of thousand, right? So, so the statistical relevance of this data is increasing very rapidly with the new tools that are available. And so there's more, I would say that it's more important for them to take that statistical relevance seriously 
because now they can compete with the quality of government data, even, you know, maybe not in the whole country, but certainly in regions where they work. And then, you know, it, it becomes a matter of a public good, because then, the, let's say, you have a government source of data, and you have private parties that say, well, you know, we don't know about the whole country, but here, we are here, and here we know what's going on. Right, so then it becomes a matter of, um, what is it again, that word? Uh, what was it? The public, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> that they can control government because they can say, hey, you know, the government has this data, but we know we have these other data sources, so maybe there's a journalist who says, hey, there's these other data sources, and it's not that good, right? So what is happening? So then it began, it can become a force for social change. Yeah, the field we see that, that even if a lot of NGOs have different types of data on somewhat the same topic, they use different wording, different methods. It's, it's still, for me, this is still, this is a beautiful story, but I, I, in, in, in real life in these countries with all the aggregated data from different NGOs, there's the amount of work you have in actually making a good database out of that is, is humongous. Uh, sometimes you, it's easier to start all over again and do it yourself in, in a good way. On actually making sure that if somebody says, well, this is, uh, I don't know, made out of wood, what type of wood is it? Is it actually wood? Who tested that it was wood? Was it iron? Um, and that, that is, that is complicated. But, but the so only way you can get alignment is yeah. if you start cooperating. Right? And this sure. is what happens with Hafias, for example. There were a lot of organizations that were trying to answer the question about food security. And they found that they all asked different questions. So at some point they came together and said, let's agree on seven questions that we all ask. And they did that. And now all of a sudden, data sets in different countries can be compared, etc., etc. But the whole, that whole process of alignment starts when you say, okay, we have to solve this as a group of organizations. Perfect. So, so the nice thing with this is that it, I think it rounds off really nicely showing that open data on its own is probably not much use, right? Uh, but what open data can spur, in other words, how is this data going to be useful in comparison to other data? And, and the, you know, getting people to realize that they're working in different ways, they're not actually helping each other or they're not collaborating well. Uh, that can really get us started in doing good stuff. So, so I think that probably rounds us off for today. Uh, thank you, guys. Yeah, cool.